Hi everybody and welcome to a new video in the Generative Music AI course. In the previous tutorial, we saw how we can implement a markup chain in Python in order to generate a melody. Today, we're gonna look at the theory behind another incredible algorithm that has been extensively used for music generation. That is cellular automata. Let's take a deeper look at the menu for today's video. We're gonna be looking at the intuition behind cellular automata first, then we're gonna formalize cellular automata, then we're gonna jump into the applications of cellular automata for music generation, and finally, we're gonna be looking at pros and cons of this algorithm for music generation. Let's dive into it. What's a cellular automaton? Well, cellular automata are models used to simulate complex systems using rules on a grid of cells. I know this may be a little bit far as a definition, so let me just make this super easy by giving you a visual representation of your typical cellular automaton. Here you have it. It's a simple grid. You have a lot of cells and cells can be either on or off and you get very nice patterns. So that's all you have really from a very high level standpoint regarding a cellular automaton. But let's dive a little bit deeper and see some of the characteristics of this quite fascinating algorithms. First of all, cellular automata do evolve over time in discrete steps. In other words, these are dynamic systems that evolve over time. Their cells, the state of their cells evolve over time. How do these cells evolve over time? Well, cells change their state based on their current state, as well as the state of the neighbor cells. There's a fascinating behavior of cellular automata. That is that you can have very simple rules that produce very complex patterns. This is typical of complex systems. And indeed, cellular automata are complex systems because they show complex behavior. Let me show you a cellular automaton that's a little bit more interesting to us. So here you have a grid, some of these cells are on, some are off, and you can see a very interesting pattern that's highly self-similar. Let's say this is step one. Then if we move to step two, you may have this situation, this new evolution of the system. So you'll see that the states of the different cells has changed. And if we move to step three, it has changed another time. And that's because of rules that allow the cellular automata to move from one state to another state. The study of cellular automata has attracted some of the best minds out there. I highly suggest you this book by Stefan Wolfram, an amazing physicist. This book is particularly interesting and highly controversial because it suggests a new paradigm for science. And one of the main points here is the exploration of cellular automata. So if you really want to dig deep into cellular automata, this is the perfect book for you. But now let's move on and take a look at some of the surprising applications of cellular automata. Cellular automata are really good at simulating some natural events and phenomena. Like for example, the patterns you can find on seashells or the branching mechanism that you can find in plants and trees or even the way crystals grow over time. Now that you have a good high level intuition about cellular automata, let's move on to formalization. We should ask ourselves, what are the different components that make up a cellular automata and that define it? The first one, of course, is the grid. And the grid actually can have different dimensionalities. Typically, you have one dimensional Mm, cellular automata, and this is just a line of cells, or you have two-dimensional mm, cellular automata. And in this case, you're gonna have an actual grid, so a plane of cells. Then you have the cell itself, and each cell in a two-dimensional cellular automaton is identified by 
It's a row position and column position. You can think of it as a matrix in a mathematical term. Then you have states. What are states? Well, states are the different conditions a cell can find itself into and each cell can take on only one out of a finite number of states. Then we have the neighborhood. That is the set of cells that surround a cell that you are analyzing at a certain point uh, in time. And the point about the neighborhood is that it is particularly important because it affects the evolution of the cell that you are analyzing. There are different ways of defining uh, neighbors for a cell. Typically, you would get the up and down, left and right neighbors, but you can also get the diagonal neighbors. Then we have something that's extremely important, that is transition rules. What are these? Well, we use rules that dictate how the state of a cell changes. And these rules are functions of both the state of the cell and the state of its neighbors. Finally, we have initial conditions, and that is just the initial state arrangement in the grid. We can initiate a cellular automaton in different ways. For example, by randomly initiating it or using a uniform distribution of some um, criteria. As an example, let me show you a fascinating cellular automaton that's also probably the most popular out there. It's called Conway's Game of Life. It tries to simulate life on a grid. Let's see how this works. You can see the evolution of the patterns there. It's quite fascinating, isn't it? It's nice. Cool. Let's try to formalize this now. As for the grid, obviously we are dealing with a two-dimensional cellular automaton. The states are binary. So you are either alive as a cell or you are dead, one or zero. The neighborhood considered here are the eight surrounding cells. So the up and down neighbor, the left and right neighbor, as well as the diagonal neighbors. Then we have three simple transition rules. Number one, we have the birth. So a dead cell can become alive at t plus one in the next step if exactly three of its neighbors are alive. In order to survive from one, one step to the next, a living cell has to have two or three of its neighbors alive. And finally, a cell dies in all other situations. As you can see, these are very simple rules, but they create very interesting patterns as we just saw. Finally, we have the initial conditions. In this case, you can just randomize the beginning or you can just have a design, some criteria that you want to overimpose in the initial state. Conway's game of life is but one of an infinite potential number of cellular automata out there. If you want to find more inspiration, other rules and cellular automata, I highly suggest you the elementary cellular automaton that comes with 256 rules. These were developed by Wolfram. Just Google them, it's quite amazing. These are extremely simple rules that create very complex self-similar behaviors and patterns. Okay, you guys, so far we've covered cellular automata outside of music, we should jump into music. So, how do we use cellular automata in order to generate music? The key here is mapping. We should find interesting, smart mappings in order to pass from just symbols, cells, states to something that's musical. Usually, I follow this sort of framework, algorithm if you want, in order to create musical cellular automata. So I start by mapping access to different musical parameters. So the uh, y-axis, could be pitch, the x-axis could be time, or it could be instruments. 
you should find a mapping for the different axes. For example, if you're dealing with a two-dimensional grid, you're going to have, of course, two axes, and you need to understand what they represent. Then I usually assign states to musical events or entities. Like, for example, it could be either on or off. So this event exists or it doesn't exist. So if it doesn't exist, probably it could be just a rest uh, or silence, musical silence. Or um, different states could be different pitches. Third step for me, instead of designing rules for musical evolution, these rules can be very simple and could know nothing about music theory, or they could be informed by some level of music theory, as you prefer, really. Finally, it's time to mapping time. So how do we get time in the cellular automaton that we are building? This could be, for example, mapped onto one of the axes. So each, for example, if you, if you take Y as time, then basically each column is something that happens at a particular bit and each column represents a particular bit or there may be different mappings. Let me show you a few examples here. By no means I want to give you the impressions that these are uh, exhaustive. You can sort of uh, permutate all of these ideas, mappings in order to come up with something that's very unique to you and that it makes sense for your particular use case. But let's take a look at this first one. So we can use cellular automata for drum pattern generation. In this case, we have time mapped on the X axis. So each column here is going to be a beat. And on the Y axis, we have for di different rows, different components of a drum kit. Like for example, the kick, the snare, the hi-hat, or the floor tom. Okay, so we are gonna be getting something like this, let's say. We run all the rules, and of course we have to design those rules, and we get a pattern like this. Of course, the states in this cellular automaton are quite straightforward. It's either active or not active. And when they're active, of course, you just have that uh, kick hit or hi-hat hit. And when they are not active, well, you just have a rest there. This is a very simple strategy to generate drum patterns, but it is surprisingly effective if you create nice rules. Let's take a look at another example. Let's generate melodies with a cellular automaton. So we're gonna be using a one dimensional cellular automaton. So it's just a simple line. And this line uh, represents time. So at each cell here, we have a different beat. Now, what the way that we can actually generate a melody is by uh, imposing a set of states that are pitches. So each cell can take on a value of a different pitch or none. None being, of course, once again, rest or silence. And so let's assume we run the rules here. And of course, like I'm not describing the rules here, but you would need to design those rules. And we get something like this. So it's a nice little melody. I want to show you a more complex example. With this cellular automaton, we generate expressive core progressions. We'll be dealing with four parameters at once. On the x-axis, we have different pitches. On the y-axis, we have different instruments. So these pitches can be played by different instruments, like an organ, a piano, or a synthesizer. Then we have states. States are the different dynamics, expressive dynamics that we want our chords, the notes that make up our chords to, to get. We start with pianissimo, we have piano, mezzo forte, forte, fortissimo, and none. None, once again, you guess it, is a way for us to say, yeah, here we don't have any activity. It's a rest, it's silence. What about time? Time is represented by the different steps, the different conditions the cellular automaton can take at different steps. And we could assume that each step represents a beat. Okay, 
So let's run this uh, algorithm and let's assume that we are at step one, this is bit one, and we have this arrangement of states for the different cells. Okay, now we can rerun the rules and we're gonna move to step two and that is bit two in our representation. And of course, we're gonna get another chord. That's interesting, isn't it? In this way, you can model time as the evolution itself of the cellular automaton. Of course, it's not mandatory that you map time directly onto direct bits. It could be whole bars or even a full phrase, if you will. I want to share some strategies that I've used in order to create a music with a cellular automata. One way I use cellular automata is to generate entire scores, but this usually doesn't land really well because these algorithms aren't really great or musical. It is way better to use cellular automata as a guideline for improvis improvisation, basically to get inspiration, to get new ideas. One way cellular automata really shine is by integrating certain lines generated with cellular automata into a wider, a larger composition. In other words, we can layer the composition and having a part that is generated by a cellular automaton and all the rest potentially could be manually created or created with other algorithms. And let's take a quick look at the strengths and limitations of this algorithm for music generation. These algorithms are quite flexible. You can use them to generate any sorts of musical parameter like melody, chords, rhythm, form, instrumentation, you name it really. They are also super fun to play with and they allow you to experiment quite a lot. You can trick them however you want. You can change the mapping of the states, the mappings of the different axes. And by doing that, you're gonna get a lot of variety and a lot of creative experimentation. They tend to be quite good for raw material, for inspiration, but they're really not the most musical algorithms out there to generate music. They tend to come with musical outputs that are not that great, especially for generating entire scores. And one of the reasons is because they really don't have any musical knowledge. They're just a mechanism to come up with interesting basic ideas, but there's no direction there. So that is something that you should incorporate yourself, perhaps by using uh, the output of these algorithms as an initial step. Let's wrap up this lecture by going through the most important points. First, cellular automata simulate complex behavior on a grid. The great thing about them is that you can use simple rules and get very complex patterns and that's the typical behavior of all complex systems. In order to formalize them, we need a bunch of different components, that is the grid, the cell, the states, the neighborhood, rules, and the initial conditions. In order to use cellular automata for music generation, the key thing is finding right mapping, mappings that work well with whatever our task currently is. It's possible to map states and grid to a lot of different musical parameters. This flexibility allows us to generate all sorts of musical constructs from chords to melody to rhythmic patterns. Finally, the musical output tends to be quite good for inspiration as the raw musical material there is quite interesting and unpredictable, but at the same time, it isn't great if we take that as the full composition. There you have it, all the theory behind cellular automata for generating music. Next time, we're gonna take all of this theory and once again, we're gonna move to Python implementation. And what are we gonna implement? We're gonna code a cellular automaton that's able to generate drum patterns. Before you go, I just want to remind you about the Sound of AI Slack community. There, you'll find more than 8,000 people super interested in all things music, AI, and audio. And there, we are also running discussions about the topics that we covered during this course. So I highly suggest you to join that community if you're not part of that. And I'll leave you the join up link in the description box. That's all for today. I hope I'll see you next time. Thank you for your attention. Take care.